Hi, I'm Brad Smith, president of Baki Graduate University. One of the things I enjoy about being part of a school that has students, alumni, and faculty in over 50 nations, as we study the word together, we find often some new insights that even though I've studied the word for decades, just having another culture, somebody else that's explored what God is doing, especially in difficult areas, in slums, in cities where often ministry is the most difficult. We also see new ways that God is revealed and we understand his love for us in new ways. One of the scripture passages that we've all read for years, but perhaps didn't see fully how it reveals God's love for us is the Good Friday passage in Matthew 27. I'll start reading at the end of Jesus's life in verse 45. Now from the sixth hour, darkness fell upon all the land until the ninth hour. And about the ninth hour, Jesus cried out with a loud voice saying, Eli, Eli, lama sabachthani, that is, my God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? And some of those who were standing there, when they heard it, began saying, this man is calling for Elijah. And immediately one of them ran and taking a sponge, he filled it with sour wine and put it on a reed and gave him a drink. And then in 50 it says, And Jesus cried out again, and with a loud voice he yielded up his spirit. So from this passage we see that Jesus' very last words were, My God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? And a lot of people, not understanding the context, look at that as if for some reason Jesus in his pain is giving up faith in God the Father. But I think when we understand the context, that's the exact opposite thing that's happening here. The other thing that's really odd is when Jesus says this, one of them, in hearing these, these words, immediately goes to get him a drink of vinegar, realizing that he's thirsty. What was it about when Jesus said these words that made somebody listening understand that he was thirsty and immediately go get him a drink? Well, something happened this year that helped me to understand this passage in a new way. I have a very good friend that had an operation. It was an operation on his heart that in, involved entering in from the vein in his leg, going up and cauterizing a part of his heart. The operation went well. Uh, several days later, he was sitting in his house overlooking a beautiful bay near Seattle. And all of a sudden, he started feeling a great deal of pain and looked down and, and, the, and the place on the vein on his leg where they had entered in with the instruments, all of a sudden had swollen up about the size of a basketball. And recognizing he was in grave danger, he cried out and his wife called 911 and then a volunteer fire department came and were wrestling him to the, the truck to get him to go to the hospital. And the whole time he recognized that he was in grave danger and was potentially dying. And as he looked at his wife with concern and realizing these may be his final words to say to his wife, he wanted to say something and just to express to her in his final words his love for her. But in his pain, all he could say was, ah, and every time he tried to say something, all that could come out was, ah, because the pain was so great. And he, the greatest thing that he was, was worried about was not so much that he would die, but somehow he would die without giving words of love to his wife. Well, later the doctors did get him to the hospital. He did survive. And now he's planned ahead by preparing a speech in advance. And for some reason, if the same thing happens, he dies suddenly or he's in such pain that he can't tell his wife about his love, he's hidden away a speech, a speech that says the very words that he wants to say, knowing that at that point of his death, he may not be able to say them. I would say that's an exact illustration of what Jesus is doing here. So when he says, my God, my God, why have thou forsaken me? Actually what he's saying to everybody listening, and they would have understood it in that context, is what we would say today is, please turn to Psalm 22. Because back in that era, if they were going to talk about a psalm or recite a psalm, usually the leader would state the first verse or the first sentence in the psalm. And people that had memorized the psalm would immediately say, oh, this is the psalm they're talking about. Didn't have the numbers, so at that point they wouldn't have said Psalm 22, but they would have known which psalm it was. Then after that first sentence was delivered, often everybody might join in and speak it in unison. Or at least they would know and listen to something that was familiar. So essentially what was happening when Jesus said, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? He was saying to everybody there, I have prepared a speech. I'm hanging on the cross and every time I breathe, I have to push up with my legs and it shoots horrible pain into my, my, my legs, into my feet. And then when I'm hanging from my hands, I'm suffocating 
And so there is no way I can deliver the final words I want you to know about what I'm thinking and what, how much that I love you and how much that I love my father. And so a thousand years before, he directed the psalmist, King David, to write his final speech. And so in the context of what was happening at the cross, when he said, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Those listening understood that he was quoting a psalm. And I think for many of them, they said, I've never understood that psalm before. And now that I hear it, now I realize that God loved us so much and he so much wanted us to understand what was happening here. He prepared the final words of love, of faith, in the pen of the psalmist, King David, a thousand years before. So those people that were at the cross listening to him say, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? They never understood that it was a rejection of God or even a crisis of faith. What they understood is he was quoting a psalm that was familiar to them. And as they thought about what he just quoted, they recognized this was not just a prophecy that was being fulfilled. This was a loving God who so much wanted to state to them his final words of love, his final words of faith in his father, that he directed the psalmist, King David, a thousand years in advance to write his death speech, the speech he could never deliver on the cross because he didn't have the breath, but the speech that would relay to them his thoughts and his faith and for them to understand what was happening at that moment. When we love somebody dearly, just as my friend did, they want to express their love and they want to express their perspective and they want to express their final words. And so let's turn to Psalm 22, but this time let's read it, thinking of it as the words that Jesus prepared as his final words to us, to those that were listening at the cross, to everybody that believes in him, for us to understand where Jesus was coming from as he died on that Good Friday. So let's read Psalm 22, but on this Good Friday, let's recognize this is Jesus' final words to us, the words he wanted us to understand and to know what was happening when he died on the cross. It starts off, as you expect, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? And when those listening at the cross heard that, they knew that he was addressing this psalm. Why are you so far from saving me, so far from the cries of my anguish? Jesus identifies with our pain, the pain of fallen creatures that have rejected God and have faced the isolation from their very source of meaning. My God, I cry out by day, but you do not answer. By night, but I find no rest. Yet you are enthroned as the Holy One, Notice, even in the expression of the pain, he comes back and says, but God, you are God. And you can see throughout this, this is not a statement of lack of faith in God. It is a statement of the reality of the pain, but in the midst of this pain, an amazing statement that God is faithful and that Jesus had full trust in God the Father. You are the one Israel praises, and you our ancestors put their trust. They trusted in you, delivered them. To you they cried out and were saved. In you they trusted and were not put to shame. But I am a worm and not a man, scorned by everyone, despised by the people. All who see me mock me. They hurl insults, shaking their heads. He trusts in the Lord, they say. Let the Lord rescue him. Let him deliver him since he delights in him, which is exactly what had been happening if you read the account of Good Friday. Yet you brought me out of the womb. You made me trust in you, even at my mother's breast. From birth, I was cast on you. From my mother's womb, you have been my God. Do not be far from me, for trouble is near, and there is no one to help. Many bulls surround me, strong bulls of Bashan encircle me, roaring lions that tear their prey, open their mouth wide against me. I am poured out like water, and all my bones are out of joint. Exactly what would happen in a crucifixion, as a shoulder is dislocated and arms are dislocated in the process of the, of the death. My heart has turned to wax. It won't be long after this that a spear is put into his side, and, and water and blood comes out. It is melted within me. And this is the passage that the person listening said, let me go get him a drink of vinegar. My mouth is dried up like a potsherd, and my tongue sticks to the roof of my mouth. And so this explains why when somebody heard him say, My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? That they went to go get him 
something to help him with his thirst because they understood he was quoting this passage and he was speaking this passage that was written a thousand years ago as a speech that was current for what was happening then. You lay me in the dust of death. Dogs surround me. A pack of villains encircle me. They, they, pierce, they pierce my hands and my feet. All my bones are on display. People stare and gloat over me. They pierce my hands and my feet. There wasn't crucifixion in David's time. And I'm sure that for those thousands of years, people read that and were confused. What is David talking about? But those listening to Jesus understood, oh, this is what they're writing about. Now, for the first time, we understand why this psalm was written and when it should have been delivered. And we are sitting here at the time, the actual time that it was written for. All my bones are on display. People stare and gloat over me. They divide my clothes among them and cast lots for my garment. Exactly what happened. But you, O Lord, do not be far from me. You are my strength. Come quickly to help me. Deliver me from the sword, my precious life from the power of the dogs. And he was resurrected. Rescue me from the mouth of the lion. Save me from the horns of the wild oxen. I will declare your name to my people. In the assembly, I will praise you. You who fear the Lord, praise him. Notice this speech ends. It talks about the pain, the reality of the pain and the isolation, but it ends with an affirmation of trust and love, that God loves Jesus, that God is whom to be trusted in. Jesus never denied that. All you descendants of Jacob, honor him, revere him, all you descendants of Israel, for he has not despised or scorned the suffering of the afflicted one. He has not hidden his face from him, but has listened to his cry for help. From you comes the theme of my praise in the great assembly, because those who fear you, I will fulfill my vows. The poor will eat and be satisfied. Those who seek the Lord will praise him. May your hearts live forever. All the ends of the earth will remember and turn to the Lord, and all the families of the nations will bow down before him, for dominion belongs to the Lord, and he rules over the nations. All the rich of the earth will feast and worship. All who go down to the dust will kneel before him. Those who cannot keep themselves alive, posterity will serve him. Future generations will be told about the Lord. They will proclaim his righteousness, declaring to a people yet unborn, he has done it. Psalm 22, a statement prepared a thousand years in advance by Jesus to be delivered as his final speech on the cross. It's a shame that we don't understand that when he said, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? He's not stating a lack of faith, but instead he is affirming his faith in God the Father. And he's affirming the goodness of God that will be told for generations to come. It is my prayer and my hope that this Good Friday, you can understand these words more and more of Jesus' statement of his love for you and the goodness of God.